I'm out here today at Moonlight State Beach in Encinitas, California. And I'm trying to do some large format, um, sort of intimate landscape scenes of the rocks that have been washed smooth and polished by the motion of the ocean waves, uh, forming these beautiful black abstract patterns in the sand. And uh, just kind of an experiment to see if I can make some good uh, nature images very close to home and right on a popular beach. So we'll see how it goes. I settled on this beautiful composition of rocks and seaweed. It's a little bit messy looking, but I really like it because it captures these details on the beach. And then I use an iPhone app to meter so I don't have to carry a huge light meter with me. I dial in the exposure on the lens, load up a film holder, in this case Arista EDU Ultra 100, which is a nice black and white film that's super affordable. Pull that dark slide out to make the exposure. And while shielding the um, film holder from sunlight, I trip the shutter and then reinsert that dark slide so that I can transport that film holder. And what a beautiful location this is. I just set up a uh, second composition here on Moonlight Beach. I found this uh, rock, it kind of looks like a meteor with the, you know, meteorite impact with the just spray of debris around it. And I love the way that those rocks kind of uh, create these abstract compositions. So it's just been a real race against time. I got my shoes completely soaked uh, because I couldn't uh, see what was coming. I had my head under the dark cloth and then a wave came and soaked me up to the ankles. So that was fun. But I've got two compositions made today, two exposures, and um, I'm running out of time. I've got to head home to beat the traffic soon, but um, it's a bright, sunny day. It is not the typical light for photography, and that's the point of today. I really want to show that you can create uh, meaningful, uh, abstract compositions and intimate nature scenes in uh, bright sunlight, high noon, on a very heavily populated beach. Uh, very close to home, uh, not in the middle of the wilderness, you know, but just right here in the city, uh, creating these nature images on large format 8x10 film. So then today I'm gonna try and go home and develop the film uh, and then make some contact prints. That's the end game. So it's been a pretty successful day with these two exposures. We'll see if we get any more. If not, then I'll see you at home. One of my favorite things about shooting this Intrepid 8x10 is just how small and light it is. This small urban backpack fits all of my 8x10 gear with two film holders, two lenses, my video camera, my small video tripod, my pano head, and everything I need for a day of shooting, which is pretty incredible. So let's head back to the truck, head home, and get that film developed. We're back at the house and I've got these three exposures in two 8x10 film holders and I've got three BTZS film development tubes. Each development tube holds a single sheet of film. You roll the film up and slide it down inside and then you basically pour the chemicals in and they slosh around in the tube and that's how you develop the film. I like the BTZS development tubes because they allow to use different uh, recipes of chemicals and temperatures in each tube. So you can have different um, sheets of film, different exposures in each tube, and then you can do them all at the same time, which allows you to have a tremendous amount of flexibility, which is super powerful when you're working with large format film. Now, the rest of this process is generally done in total absolute darkness, but I'm gonna do it for you with a dummy sheet of film in the light, just so you can see how the process works in the dark room. So first, I'm gonna remove the dark slide, open the end flap, and um, kind of find a way to pull the film out very carefully without scratching it. Then lift the film gently, give it a little tug, 
and slide it out of the film holder, hopefully without scratching it. And uh, then from that point, the film is ready to go into the development tube. Now it's important that the emulsion side is on the inside so the chemicals can be exposed to it. These top notches here tell me what film stock I'm working with and also which side the emulsion is on in the dark room. So now I'm gonna slide the film very carefully into the development tube. And I kind of use my hands to keep it from scratching the edges of the tube as I push it in. And just pop it in there, make sure it's firmly seated so it's not gonna slide out when I turn it upside down. And then um, I wanna screw the cap back on to make it light tight. And then from that point, I'm able to work with the film in the light uh, without having to keep in total darkness. Once the film is loaded into the canisters and the canisters are sealed, I'm actually gonna go back into total darkness to load the developer chemicals into the tubes. So to get the developer into the actual tube, we're gonna take eight ounces of rotanol in 150 dilution, and that's one part of chemical to 50 parts of water. We're gonna pour it into the cap of the tube. And um, what that's gonna allow me to do is to pour, uh, to screw the, the tube onto the cap, keep it in the upright position, and then when I tip it, it starts the chemical interaction with the film. And uh, that's really important that you have an instant total immersion in the chemical. So we're good to go. So when the development time actually starts, I vigorously shake the tubes. And I usually actually do this with all three of them simultaneously. Um, but just for the sake of the camera, I'm going to do one just to show you what the process looks like. And then we're going to take all three of the development tubes and just float them in a tray of tap water. This is a 16 by 20 inch uh, film development tray. And then I'm going to just rotate the tubes by spinning them in the water. And that's the agitation process. And I use an app called Massive Dev Chart to show me all of the, the recipe for the film. And it has timer and agitation indicators on the screen. It also has a dark room mode and that app is super useful. So I usually keep that phone um, magnetized to the mirror in my bathroom. And that's how I uh, time the development. And this part can be done in the light. Once the development process is complete, I can then open the tubes and drain the developer. Now I'm not gonna show that here, um, but basically what I do is I dispose of the developer chemical and then I can allow water into the tube. And I still do this part in total darkness and the water serves as my stop bath. Occasionally I, I use a chemical stop bath, but with my particular recipe, uh, I can use water, which is really convenient and saves me on chemicals. Once the development and the stop bath are complete, we grab a new tray. This tray is gonna be for the fixer. I also use a large measuring cup. Now here we have the fixer. This is a photographer's formulary TF5 archival rapid fixer. I like this because it allows me to minimize my use of chemicals and I can use water as a stop bath. I like to store the used fixer in these uh, cold brew coffee jars and I keep them in a dark cabinet just to protect it. Um, this particular jar is for prints. So we're gonna pour this fresh batch of fixer into the tray. Now I do this at the last possible second because fixer is really noxious. It smells like ammonia and it's really mixing your eyes water and it's terrible stuff. So you wanna do that at the last minute. I also normally wear um, gloves for this part of the process, but because this is water for the sake of the video, I didn't have to do that. So what we're gonna do here, and again, this is a dummy sheet of film. Now normally you'd be able to see the exposure by now. But what I'm doing is in very dim light, I'm gonna be rocking the tray back and forth to agitate the fixer over the film. And uh, that's to make sure that the fixer soaks into the film completely and the fixer stops the chemical reactions completely, locking in that exposure so that the film can then be um, handled in broad daylight and the film is complete. Once the fixing process is done, I can then remove the film from the fixer. This takes about four minutes for the whole process, after which I rinse it in clean water for 10 minutes, and then it goes onto the drying rack for about two hours. Once that's done, we can handle the film. I don't have a light table, so I use my computer screen. On this first exposure, we have a light leak. It was crazy bright out. I got tons of sunburn, and I think the sun was just too much. I don't know what happened there. The second, this thing, I, 
I think I left the shutter open while I pulled the dark side or something. Rookie mistake. I don't know what I was thinking. This final exposure actually worked out. I think I'm going to crop it. And so to do that, I'm going to need to scan it and use a digital hybrid process to print it. So using this DIY film holder that I made from a cat food placemat gotten at Target uh, using Ben Horn's instructions, I'm just gonna tape it down using 3M um, scotch tape, which never leaves residue and is really uh, sturdy. Hold it on there nice and tight. And then I use this cutting board to basically allow me to move the film. So we're gonna clean the scanner before we put it on. This is important because tiny dust specks are a ginormous pain to clean and they take up to you know, several hours to dust spot the scans. So by cleaning the scanner, I can avoid that. So now we're gonna slide the film very, very, very carefully onto the scanner, careful not to detach it from that film holder. We're gonna pull that cutting board out very carefully, make sure it's in there nice and snug with no gaps, and then close the scanner lid. Make sure that's nice and firm, turn the scanner on, and we're ready to go to the computer. So I use Epson Scan. It's the software that came with the scanner and it honestly works the best. Now we're gonna get these settings set up. I'm gonna use Film Area Guide because it's a flat film holder. I'm gonna use black and white negative film, 16-bit grayscale, 1200 DPI, which will give me a 186 megapixel scan. I like to uncheck that unsharp mask because I like to do my own sharpening. And then we're gonna hit preview. I fast forwarded this because it takes a really long time. Uh, basically what we're gonna do now is set up the histogram, which is super critical because this is how you get a proper scan exposure. So I'm basically setting the, br the input white point to the right side of the histogram curve and the black point to the left side. And then I'm adjusting the output uh, white and black points to make sure that there are no cutoffs in the shadows or highlights. So no blown out shadows or highlights. Uh, then I'm just gonna save the file, um, save it as a TIFF file and hit scan. Uh, the scan took four minutes. See me spinning around on the chair here. It takes a really long time. <laughs> and it's finally done. So once the file is opened in Photoshop, I like to pull it up in Adobe Camera Raw. And because the file is so massive, I have to crank up the sharpening really big because the sharpening settings are relative to pixel dimensions. So the bigger the pixel dimensions, the higher the sharpening settings. So I need to use I'll mount 150 and radius 3.0. I'm kind of adjusting the detail um, to taste. In this particular situation, I'm actually gonna over sharpen it intentionally because I think the camera moved a tiny bit during the exposure, probably because I didn't use a cable release. Also, the tripod was on wet sand, so oops. So we're just gonna make the best of that and basically adjust the detail to be as sharp as I can get it um, while zoomed in really far. So with the sharpening figured out, now I'm gonna go into the exposure settings and I'm gonna save all the highlights and all the shadows. I do this on pretty much all of the exposures unless it doesn't, unless it totally screws up the image. Uh, this is because you want as much dynamic range as possible. So now I'm gonna bring the blacks in and kind of crush them. Um, I don't wanna crush them super far. Like I want there to be detail in the shadows, but I also like having some pure blacks. And then I'm gonna bring up the whites a little bit also, uh, that's to bring that contrast back. Lastly, I'm gonna just tweak the clarity a little bit, again, because this particular exposure wasn't as sharp as I'd really like. I don't normally do that. And I'm um, just checking everything to make sure it looks good. And then I'm gonna basically apply that. Now I'm gonna grab a quick curves adjustment layer. I like to use adjustment layers because they're non-destructive. That's super important when you're editing to not destroy your underlying file with your curves and levels and stuff. Um, I always, I almost always use these curves layers just because I like to control the contrast really precisely and uh, the tonal range in each individual image. And basically, I'm just going to bring the shadow and highlight curves uh, to a point where I'm visually satisfied with them um, and where I don't feel like I'm crushing the shadows or highlights too much. Now, because that's not always perfectly possible, because I want the whole image to look good, but sometimes I have to bring the curves a little more extreme than would be ideal. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually masking out uh, the curves that are crushing those shadows too much with um, a mask. Now for the most boring part of the whole thing, I'm going to quickly use a spot healing brush to clone out all the dust spots and scratches, which takes forever. So I really fast forwarded it here for you guys. 
And then I'm just gonna crop, adjust the crop a little bit to make sure the scan is nice and clean and not getting the edges of the film in my picture at all. And uh, I'm gonna do a last minute adjustment layer just to make sure I didn't screw up the levels. And that's again, bringing that white point to the right side of the histogram and the black point to the left side of the histogram. Now this is the part where I decide on the crop. <laughs> So basically I was not satisfied with my composition because I felt like I had too much negative space in this composition. So I decided to bring it in tight and then I felt like it was more of a vertical orientation. So I decided to flip it over and give that some better visual energy. So now I've got that nice powerful energy sweeping in from the top right to the bottom left of the comp, which I think is a lot stronger. And uh, now I'm just kind of messing around a little bit with the contrast. And finally, we are ready to go to print. So I open up two versions of this file and I proof the left side as monitor, which is gonna be my sort of reference. And the right side I'm proofing to my paper, which is gonna be the, the ICC profile for Red River um, Arctic Polar Luster on the Canon um, Pro 100. And uh, now I'm able to make sure that my proofed version for print matches my original edit. Now, once again, I'm gonna use a curves adjustment layer. And honestly, these are so darn similar that it barely takes any work at all to make them the same. I'm just gonna apply a very, very, very gentle curves um, adjustment to this, like really slight. Um, as you can see, the reaction is pretty extreme, even when I just pull it a little bit in either direction. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it. It doesn't have to be exact because honestly, I'm just looking for a print that I'm visually satisfied with, that I like. Um, so I'm constantly working towards that vision of what I'm trying to you know, create in the finished print. And then uh, once I'm happy with it, I'm just gonna lock in that curves adjustment layer and we'll be all set. So before we do that final print, I am gonna zoom in really far and I'm gonna check for mistakes or glitches. And guess what? We got some dust here. Uh, you see that little bit of uh, dust on the rock. So I'm gonna clone that out with a uh, soft I'm oh, sorry, spot healing brush. And uh, that's real easy to do, but it's super critical to do that because otherwise that's gonna show up in the print and we definitely do not want that. So just kind of eyeballing this print, making sure everything looks good. And then we're gonna go and uh, do an image size adjustment. And now this is where I'm gonna size uh, the image for the actual print. And um, I'm gonna actually have to throw away quite a bit of resolution to get down to an eight by 10 inch print. Um, so what we're gonna do here is uh, basically set the size to width eight, height 10, resolution 600 DPI. In this case, um, sometimes I do 720, but honestly for my printer, 600 is pretty much all you need to max out the printer as far as how much ink it can put onto a paper. And um, yeah, I'm gonna use Bicubic Sharper to make sure that's nice and crispy. And so I think we're pretty much all set. You can see, you know, there's an insane ludicrous amount of detail in this uh, file, and we're gonna send this off to the printer. Now, because I use a Canon Pro printer, I am gonna use the Print Studio Pro and configure the uh, printer for the print. The media type is set according to what's recommended by the paper manufacturer. I'm gonna use the ICC profile set that ICC profile to the one I just proofed against, which is the Red River um, Arctic Polar Luster for the Canon Pro 100. And I uh, just use relative colorimetric um, rendering intent, enable soft proofing, and then we are all set. And I think we're good to go. So we're gonna hit print. And I always think any kind of print appearing is just some kind of magic. It's just so fun to make prints from your work. And uh, here's the finished print just popping out of the printer here. So let's take a look at it. So we're gonna throw it up on the desk and set up that overhead cam for you guys. So here's the finished print. This is what the fruit of all that labor was all about. And let's zoom in here and take a look at some of the detail. Obviously you could see a whole heck of a lot more detail with a loop. And I often use a 4X professional magnifying loop to look at these, um, but you can get some idea of the detail here. Uh, we're putting 600 DPI in the paper, which is two times the level of detail that um, most photographic prints are, because most are 300 DPI. And you can just see here, it's almost three dimensional. 
due to that incredible level of detail afforded by large format. The thing that blows my mind is that I had to throw away a massive amount of image data to make an 8x10 print. I could do this level of detail with a 30 by 40 inch print and pretty darn close to it on a 40 by 50 inch print, which is just mind blowing to me. Um, that's what you get with a negative that's 52 times the size of full frame. So that is one of the many reasons that I shoot large format film today. I hope you enjoyed coming along on my journey of making this print from start to finish. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps me out a lot. I'm Justin Lowry, and until next time, stay curious.